Coming up on New Day at Adidang, South Korea sees a slight reduction in the number of new COVID-19 cases, but the caseload is forecast to increase further into the week. Also, high school students anxious ahead of their college entrance exam. More than 65 firms, including South Korea's Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix, agree to US calls to submit data to boost transparency in supply chains. This as bottlenecks are causing global shortages. Plus, people in South Korea could be seeing delays in online deliveries and even some shortages at shops. This as more than half of the country's diesel trucks need a special chemical solution, which is in extremely short supply right now. Hello and welcome to this Tuesday edition of New Day at Arirang. I'm Kim Mo-kyan. It's 8 a.m. Korea time on November 9th here in Seoul, South Korea. I'm Mark Broom. Uh, as always, we have a packed show for you over the next hour. We'll be taking a look at the big news stories of the day and get some expert insights on the issues facing Korea and the world. Now we start with the COVID-19 situation in South Korea. The country has been rolling out its gradual return to normal scheme and we've seen life come back to businesses and also the streets are more full with people. Yes, uh, but we've also seen the number of deaths and those in a critical condition spike in the past few weeks. To that, health authorities ask that everyone strictly abide by virus prevention measures such as wearing masks so that the country can continue easing restrictions on private gatherings and business operations. To bring us the latest, we have our Shin Ye in, in the studio for us. Good morning, Ian. Good morning. Now, Ian, let's start with the number of new infections we're expecting for today. We're actually expecting this number to stay around the 1700s. Up until 9 p.m. yesterday, 1,536 were confirmed. But what's worth noting even more is the number of critically ill patients and deaths. Just last week, the daily average for those in a critical condition jumped by 8.8 percent compared to the week before. And the number of deaths also jumped by 32.5 percent in a week. So what we're seeing is more people critically ill and more deaths. Did the authorities expect this rise and perhaps more importantly, were they prepared for it? As a matter of fact, they did expect to see this rise and they added that their current medical capability was well prepared. So take a listen. Though we've seen the number of critically ill patients and especially deaths go up the past week, we currently have the medical capability to bring this number down. Nearly half of all our hospital beds are empty. To further strengthen each region's medical response, we're finding ways to activate treatment from home. But the authorities caution that everyone needs to work on bringing this number down. If virus prevention measures aren't strictly kept, we might experience a resurgence in cases like some other countries that have attempted COVID-19 exit strategies. In order for us to safely transition to normal life, everyone needs to participate. Well, Yen, speaking of um, countries that attempted COVID-19 exit strategies but have seen a resurgence in cases, um, I heard that Germany has the highest level of COVID-19 infection rates since the pandemic first began. Can you tell us more on that? Right. So Germany is seeing a resurgence. And to give you some numbers, Germany on Monday reported 15,513 new infections and 33 deaths. In total, Germany has more than 4.7 million infections and 96,000 deaths. Now, Germany's seven-day infection rate, which is basically the number of people per 100,000 to have been infected over a week, rose to 201.1 as of Monday. This was higher than its previous peak of 197.6 last December. And health authorities say if infections continue to spread at this pace, the number of critically ill patients will double from now. Germany currently has more than 2,500 patients being treated in hospital, which is similar to its record from last winter. And they added nearly 90% of all new patients are unvaccinated. Right, and uh, the vast majority of medical experts do suggest people get vaccinated uh, where possible uh, if their doctor recommends them to do so. Uh, from next year, we're also gonna be seeing these antiviral pills uh, come out. We know that South Korea has uh, 
put orders in for some batches and uh, should get them early next year. But what about other countries? Right, so yesterday, yesterday we talked about how the hottest pills in town right now are those made from Pfizer and Merck, and they're called Paxlovid and Molnupiravir. I also mentioned how South Korea is set on securing deals with relevant companies. One update is the country will start distributing more than 400 4,000 courses of the treatment from next February. Meanwhile, some 90 countries around the world are in active discussions regarding buying the antiviral pills. The UK became the first country to approve Merck's Molnupiravir last week, and the U.S. said it already secured millions of courses worth of the Paxlovid treatment from pharmaceutical company Pfizer, as Pfizer is set on submitting successful clinical trial results to the FDA and waiting for approval. Some firms in China have also expressed an interest in producing experimental COVID-19 drugs developed by Merck under a global program to distribute to developing countries. And we're still waiting to see what Israel will do. All right, let's hope this pills could help us get back to normal life. Now, thank you for your report, Ian, and we'll talk to you again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, moving on, the Chinese military appears to be using mock-ups of a U.S. aircraft carrier and other warships for missile target practice at a weapons testing range in a remote desert. The U.S. Naval Institute reports that satellite images taken last month show the targets are in the shape of a U.S. aircraft carrier and guided missile destroyers. Beijing's foreign ministry spokesperson said Monday that China was unaware of such reports. North Korea conducted an artillery fire competition over the weekend. In an unusual step for the regime, leader Kim Jong-un was not there to watch. Our North Korean affairs correspondent Kim Dami reports. Seoul's Unification Ministry said Monday it will closely watch Pyongyang's moves in regards to the North's recent artillery fire competition that was held without leader Kim Jong-un. While recognizing Kim's non-attendance, the ministry spokesperson noted that the North has previously conducted various forms of military drills and competitions like the one on Saturday. The South Korean government will closely monitor the North's related moves rather than predicting its intentions regarding Kim Jong-un's attendance or publicizing such military training activities. Pyongyang state media reported Sunday that North Korea carried out an artillery fire competition the day before in an effort to boost the regime's defense capabilities. With leader Kim Jong-un absent, Park jong chun a member of the Presidium of the Politburo of the ruling party, guided the event. Though it's unusual for the North to showcase such a competition without their leader present, one expert noted that it's a part of Kim's governing style. Ever since the Eighth Party Congress in January, Kim Jong-un has designated other officials in the economic and defense fields to watch over areas, including military drills. Another expert pointed out that Gim's absence could be an attempt by the North to downplay the event, insisting that such activities are ordinary and purely defensive, while at the same time sending a message to the U.S. and its allies. Pyongyang has long urged Washington to drop so-called double standards over military activities, as well as hostile policies against the regime. It seems that the North is showing a low-intensity provocation related to the North's recent statement urging for Washington's withdrawal of double standards and hostile policies. The regime's weekly propaganda publication over the weekend also criticized the recent hard Washington joint air exercises, slamming that the nature of such activity cannot be weakened whether they're downscaled or behind closed doors. Kim Dami, Arirang News. South Korea is preparing a new venue for private and international organizations to discuss health issues related to North Korea. The Korean Peninsula Health and Medical Cooperation Platform launches on Wednesday. According to the Unification Ministry, a joint declaration on the vision, goals and the road for operations will also be issued. The platform will be an open space for anyone interested in the North's health care, voicing hope for sustainable and efficient medical cooperation with the regime. Now it's time for On Point, where we speak to experts to delve deeper into the biggest news stories in the spotlight right now. South Korea's intel agency recently told 
Uh, lawmakers at the National Assembly that the term Kim Jong-un-ism is now in use internally in North Korea as Kim seeks to carve out his own legacy, a step fully out of the uh, shadows of his father and grandfather as well as to further solidify his grip on power. He reportedly ordered all portraits of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il be removed from venues where the Workers' Party meets. Yes, for more on this, we connect to Mark Barry, a longtime North Korea expert and the associate editor of the International Journal of World Peace. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Now, Mark, what does Kim's move suggest about his own confidence as leader? And is it a smart move on his part? Uh, it's almost the 10th anniversary of his assuming office rather suddenly. Uh, you'd almost have to say that if he didn't do this, there would be something odd. Uh, he almost is compelled to do so, uh, especially as he ap approaches uh, his 40th year. Uh, and um, really, it's it's a name change. And I'm not even sure if these reports about the taking down of the portraits of his father and grandfather are, uh, are that accurate. It's just really hard to verify that because uh, visitors can't get in very easily. And also even many, most of the diplomats uh, have been sent home or have gone home. So, you know, we have to take all those kind of reports with a grain of salt. But the main thing is it's his 10th anniversary in power and it's almost an expected move. Yeah, it would seem rather disrespectful to him just to suddenly take down all the portraits of his father and grandfather considering their importance to the regime. Uh, but in regards to something else North Korea has been up to in recent days, uh, artillery firing exercises. These happened uh, just a couple of days ago. Now, people say the, this move was really aimed at kind of uh, getting a message over to Washington and Seoul uh, to try and stop them having this kind of hostile policy towards the North, as the North keeps saying. Does this kind of behavior have a track record of working? And if not, why does the North persist with it? I think they're doing the artillery exercises to do artillery exercises. If they didn't do this kind of training, then uh, the United States and other nations would get the idea that something is, is seriously wrong. So as, as uh, serious and, and, and uh, uh, pressuresome the uh, impending food crisis is, they don't want to show that their military readiness is down. So they're basically trying to show, it's, it's kind of like uh, if, they were, if they were close to starvation, they still would tighten their belt and pick the food with a toothpick out, out of their mouth to show that they're full. Uh, I think that's the kind of uh, thing that's going on. But it has its domestic purpose, which is military training for the sake of military training. And also, um, a crackdown is reportedly happening in the North to stamp out foreign culture, primarily music and movies that filter across from South Korea, as well as efforts to crush that regime label's corrupt capitalist tendencies. What's the regime's rationale behind this crackdown? You know, this opens up a huge question, which is, with the success of Parasite, with the success of uh, Squid Game, of, of uh, Minari, and and the huge success of BTS and other groups, South Korea is a global power. And North Korea is stuck with the branding of 1945 to 1948, and really not that much to show for it, except for nuclear weapons and uh, potentially intercontinental range missiles. So the question is, what is North Korea these days? And is the dream of unification uh, really what it was uh, to the North Korean people, to the population? Can the regime trumpet that anymore? So I think these are the hard questions that they're trying to, to deal with. And they fall back on old measures, which is to trump the ideology, trump the great leader. But they, 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 they have come to the point to realize that South Korea is no longer the other Korea. It's a global power, a global phenomenon. So that's an identity crisis for North Korea. Certainly is. Now, economically speaking, final question before we have to let you, on go, uh, get, let you go, unfortunately. But North Korea really is having a torrid time in terms of its economy, even by its own standards, in years gone by. In light of this, 
Now, the regime seems to be tentatively restarting cross-border trade. Uh, that was all hollowed, of course, when the pandemic started. In your mind, do you think North Korea has to, at this point, fully reopen trade links with China, maybe to a lesser extent Russia, if it wants to get through, you mentioned it before, the food shortages, what is going to be another grueling winter? Uh, it, indeed, they would like to do as much as they can, but we have to actually uh, evaluate what they did when COVID began to strike, which is that they did something more severe to themselves than even the sanctions have done uh, in, in all the pre recent previous years. So... Uh, North Korea is accustomed to dealing with these massive crises of, uh, of, of goods, of consumer goods, and even of food supplies. Uh, they may think there's a way they can somehow manage it. Uh, but at the same time, we also have to know that there'll be suffering and there'll be sacrifice. Uh, and we may not have the eyes and the ears on the ground like we did in the mid-1990s to tell us what's really going on. But somehow North Korea thinks that its sovereignty and its independence is the highest value, and uh, they're going to do everything they can to just make it, even if they don't get the normal help that they would get from China. Well, Mark, as always, we appreciate your insights on the matter. Thank you for joining us. We'll talk to you again soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, with the world enduring a mass shortage of chips, the U.S. recently asked global chip makers to share information that Washington says will boost transparency when it comes to the supply chain. So far, over 60 companies have handed over that data as the deadline draws ever closer. South Korea's two major chip makers are also preparing to share their own information. Kim Bo Young with this report. Following a request from the U.S. to global chip makers for semiconductor data to help them grapple with a crippling chip shortage, two of South Korea's major chip makers are set to do so on Tuesday. Amid an ongoing chip shortage, the U.S. Commerce Department in September had asked chip companies to fill out questionnaires comprised of 26 topics, such as the company's inventories and backlogs, setting a deadline of November 8th local time. Though it said the sharing of information is voluntary, U.S. Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo in September said the U.S. might use compulsory measures to get the data if needed. The reason for the data request was said to be in order to boost supply chain transparency and identify where bottlenecks are, but the appeal for data triggered industry concerns over chipmakers' own trade secrets. According to the U.S. federal government's website, 67 chip companies have submitted a response so far, and about 24 of them have been uploaded to the site following the Commerce Department's review. TSMC, a major contract chip maker, is among several companies to have supplied Washington with data, yet they said on Monday that no detailed information on clients was disclosed. The world's two biggest makers of memory chips, South Korea's Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix, will soon also file a response to the U.S.'s request, but as widely expected, are reportedly going to leave out detailed information. Even after the imminent request is dealt with, local experts say that the U.S. might ask for further information as U.S. Congress has not yet approved the $52 billion U.S. dollar bill to boost U.S. chip manufacturing. Meanwhile, industry minister Moon Sung-uk is scheduled to meet Raimondo during his visit to Washington, D.C., following the deadline to discuss the chip supply chain issues. Kim bo -kyung, Arirang News. Now, despite the ambitious targets agreed to by countries at the U.N. climate change conference in Glasgow, the Washington Post says there's a huge gap between what nations declare as their emissions and the amount they're actually pumping into the atmosphere. Kim hyo Sun with the details. As criticism mounts over the lack of substantial progress at the UN Climate Summit, the Washington Post is reporting that the emission reduction pledges made by countries were built on flawed data. 
It says a team of experts have looked into reports submitted by 196 countries. The investigation, it says, found many had undercounted their greenhouse gas emissions. It adds there was an enormous gap ranging from at least 8.5 billion to as high as 13.3 billion tons a year of underreported emissions. For instance, the data submitted to the UN by Malaysia shows the country's annual emissions at just 81 million tons, less than Belgium, due to its forests and jungles that consume vast amounts of CO2. However, data compiled by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization indicates Malaysia actually released 422 million tons of greenhouse gases in 2016, placing it among the world's top 25 emitters. The Washington Post also found that methane emissions make up a second major portion of missing greenhouse gases in the UN database. It adds that countries are undercounting methane emissions of all kinds, ranging from the oil and gas sector to agriculture and human waste. Moreover, the report points out there are fundamental problems that lead to the gap, noting how developed countries have one set of standards, while developing nations have another. It also says some 45 countries, including Algeria and Libya, have not reported any new greenhouse gas numbers since 2009. Kim Hyo-sun, News. In the coming weeks, people in South Korea could be seeing delays in products ordered online, even shortages at some shops. This is because more than half of the diesel trucks here need urea water solution, which is in extremely short supply right now. However, the government is pressing hard to secure as much of this solution as possible from overseas. Kim Sung-min with this report. Right now in South Korea, it's not hard to find gas stations with a sign saying urea water solution out of stock. This clear liquid, also called diesel exhaust fluid, reduces pollution from diesel, but practically, diesel vehicles these days can't operate without it. And this once cheap and easy-to-obtain fluid has become extremely scarce all across South Korea. None. We have none in stock. We received a little last Monday, but it was all gone that day. And it's killing me. Some customers think that gas stations are stockpiling it, but I'm sure almost all the stations in Seoul couldn't secure it. Those biggest hit are diesel trucks, as they need much more of the fluid, around 10 liters for every 300 to 400 kilometers. And considering around 60 percent of the 3 million diesel trucks in the country require the fluid to operate, the shortage could halt distribution chains across the country. This is one of the biggest truck terminals in Seoul, a base for hundreds of delivery trucks. I'm here to find out exactly how this shortage will impact drivers and, in turn, how it will affect consumers. Hong Yi-sang, a truck driver who delivers new cars, worries that the shortage will soon halt his deliveries entirely. Two days ride. I think I'll have to stop the truck in two days with the current amount I have. I just talked to another driver in Andong. He also asked me if I have some left. Experts worry that the prolonged shortage will have knock-on effects across many industrial sectors, affecting not only consumers but also the automobile and construction sectors which require the fluid. The shortage is because China, the main exporter of urea water solution, cut its exports to South Korea. China's trade dispute with Australia has led to a bottleneck of coal, which is essential in producing urea water solution. The dependency was too strong. 97 percent, so basically 100 percent, came from China. And as they cut exports, South Korea could not immediately diversify its import channels. President Moon Jae-in on Monday ordered the utmost efforts to stabilize the supply of urea water solution. That includes importing some 27,000 liters of urea water solution from Australia, as well as some 200 tons of urea from Vietnam. But this won't be enough to end the shortage. Also starting Monday until the end of the year, the hoarding of urea will be banned. Sellers reserve more than 10 percent above their monthly average sales last year will face a fine of up to 85,000 U.S. dollars or be imprisoned for up to three years.
Experts say the government should put all efforts into weathering the storm for the next two to three months while also coming up with long-term plans like encouraging domestic production. Countries like Russia are making urea water solution, but it will take around two to three months to secure supplies. And to produce it locally, profitability has to be ensured, so the government can maybe give incentives to a few firms to produce the material. He also added the urea water solution shortage shows the importance of diversifying import channels in advance for all key materials. Kim Sung-min, Arirang News. And now we cross over to our Oseyang for Global Insight and an in-depth look at important developments in world affairs. Thanks very much, Morgan. Now it's time for Global Insight, where we connect with experts from around the world on issues making headlines. And as the world suffers a supply chain crisis and various trade disputes amid this coronavirus pandemic, South Korea is also experiencing major constraints to business and trade. Computer chip makers Samsung and SK Hynix have been under pressure to share sensitive information with the US government, which has pledged to reduce its reliance on Asian firms. Meanwhile, within the country, a shortage of imported diesel exhaust fluid, or DEF, is threatening to halt transport and logistics. So the country's top policymakers have been trying to resolve these trade and supply chain related issues over the past few weeks. And we discussed these developments today with Robert Hansville, Bank of America University Distinguished Professor of Supply Chain Management at North Carolina State University and Anut Srivastava, Canada Research Chair of the Haskane School of Business at the University of Calgary. Very warm welcome to you both. And well, to start things off, let's go with you first, Dr. Hanfield. Now, making headlines here in South Korea is, again, the shortage of DEF, which is a key liquid solution that neutralizes emissions from the estimated 2 million diesel cargo trucks here in the country. Now, China has put the brakes on exporting the solution due to its own energy crunch. Do you expect China's power shortage to continue throughout the winter? And if so, how is it going to affect logistics around the world? Uh, well, yes. Well, thank you for having me today. And yes, I think this example shows how interconnected these supply chains really are. And as you pointed out, uh, DEF uh, is, is feared to disrupt the supply chain in, in Korea. Uh, it's a very common, low-cost uh, liquid. Uh, South Korea actually manufactured urea uh, as, early, as early as 2011. It's not complex technology. Uh, it's made by adding carbon dioxide to ammonia. Uh, but the decision was made to outsource it to China and Russia, where they produce coal or natural gas to extract ammonia. And as a result, uh, Korea has become completely dependent on it. And uh, when they decided to limit exports, it of course impacts the transportation sector in Korea, which uh, will definitely impact supply chains and cause supply chain disruptions within Korea, but also likely in other parts of the world. Other parts of the world are very dependent on China and the coal shortages in China are shutting down production, which is also causing disruptions to all kinds of manufactured parts that are produced in China. Right, and well, as you said, Korea decided that it would be more cost effective to outsource um, the production of DEF, but now it looks like uh, local producers might have to reconsider now as well. Uh, Dr. Shrivastava, uh, computer chips, that's also been making the headlines here. They power everything from small wearable devices and mobiles to aircraft and military systems, but they do require the sophisticated uh, technology and they're currently also in short supply as well. And that's why many governments, including South Korea, the United States and the European Union, they've all announced plans to become major semiconductor producers over the next decade or so. So what really is the strategic importance of having this cutting edge technology? Uh, hi, Seong, great to be back in your program. Uh, when we last met, we expected that chip shortage will somehow sort itself out in about six months time. Manufacturing will ramp up, demand for electronics will cool down, supply chain issues will disappear. But as we look around, it looks like the problem is here to stay. It has worsened and it has become almost unmanageable. Uh, more important, it is not being now being looked not just as a consumer goods issue, but also a top national priority uh, for at least two reasons. People now realize that just one Taiwanese company controls about two thirds of global supply chain. 
and this fact is not changing anytime soon so any mishap uh, such as earthquake flood fire or even water problems at tsmc can halt the entire global supply chains second if china takes control over taiwan or tsmc the world would be left scrambling and finally this is a very important point future wars would be fought with machines robots drones and artificial intelligence and chips will play a very important role in that theater so whoever controls the next generation of chips can also become the next military superpower so that's why you see these spade of announcements from various governments including korea us european union and even india Oh, well, U.S. policymakers, they've certainly been taking steps to really ramp up their uh, semiconductor uh, production. And while well, they've the, uh, the Commerce Department, they've been requesting um, comp that companies like Samsung South Korean SK Hynix and Taiwan's uh, TSMC to divulge information about their uh, clients, production volume, inventory levels, all very sensitive information. Um, so really, well, what, what is the risk of actually uh, sharing this information? I'm not clear why US government wanted this data and what they can do with this data, at least in short term, and how can it solve the global supply problems. Uh, I believe that no company should be asked to be its trade secrets or client information or client confidential data unless that company is harming the national uh, Samsung, TSMC, SK Hynix have rightly declined to provide these details. It's not just a question of risk to chip manufacturers, but also to the clients in the whole supply chain. Again, in my view, no company should be asked to provide this confidential data with any government, especially foreign government, period. Well, many governments are, uh, they seem to be putting national interest um, on top of, uh, in front of all these supply chain issues. And while well, Dr. Handveld, uh, geopolitical conflicts and these complications, they really haven't helped, uh, least of all the trade war between Australia and China, which has, for example, impacted commodities and uh, solutions, including DF here in South Korea. And well, do you think global supply chains, particularly in energy related uh, sectors, will become even more tightly squeezed and complicated due to the geopolitics? No, absolutely. And that's that's unfortunate that uh, geopolitics are, are definitely playing a role. Uh, we saw this in the U.S., of course, for a long time with the uh, tariffs that the U.S. was imposing on China and China was thus imposing tariffs on U.S. Uh, products as well. The, the ongoing issue you're seeing with coal right now, uh, Australia is one of the primary suppliers of coal for China. Uh, and uh, China, therefore, was unhappy with Australia's criticisms of uh, its lack of transparency around the source of the COVID-19 uh, virus and, and where the origin was. Uh, Australia criticized China. China says, well, we're not happy with you. We're going to stop uh, buying your coal and uh, put, put, a, put a, uh, a stop to that, even though China was reliant on their coal. Uh, they were they were putting a stop to it, but China is also trying to keep up with the uh, Paris Accord and uh, trying to cut back on the use of coal. And uh, the way the system works is they simply will tell their politicians uh, to stop using coal, and they'll cut off coal, and, and it'll cut off energy to a lot of manufacturers and cause disruptions all over the world. So there is a, a follow-on effect that's occurring, which is unfortunate, and we're going to likely see more of that, uh, these geopolitical disputes that uh, end up impacting uh, supply chains. And that's one thing that companies need to be aware of and keep track of what's happening geopolitically now as well, because they are risks that impact their, their own production. And definitely South Korean companies, the chip makers, Samsung uh, Electronics and SK Hynix, they've been trying to model through this and on the semiconductor front. And Dr. Srivastava, uh, now these two companies, they've been talking with uh, US Commerce Department officials and they seem to have reached some sort of understanding that uh, the chip companies will provide second tier information regarding their businesses in return for, uh, for instance, Samsung temporarily producing automotive um, semiconductors in in the US and Austin, Texas. So there seems to be some kind of compromise going on here. What would this uh, second tier information be? 
Um, I think uh, U.S. government asked TSMC and Intel and Samsung, many different companies, not just Korean companies, to provide very detailed data on their sales, inventory status, and clients. They asked some 26 detailed questions. Information was requested on a voluntary basis, but the fact is that all companies have rightfully declined to provide detailed data, particularly on clients. Uh, more importantly, I'm unsure how demand for, for data can force a company to move its production base to a different com to a different country. It takes 10 to $15 billion and several years to, to put up a new semi semiconductor fab. Companies make such decisions based on demand, technology, profitability, payback period, and risk. No company would change its decision just because the U.S. government starts probing for more information. On the contrary, it is a deterrent, not an attraction to shift your production base. And Dr. Shrivastavas, while some suspected that it was a move to um, use this information to benefit companies like Intel uh, in the US, but also there were some uh, suspicions that maybe the Commerce Department's demands were made um, as a means of getting Samsung to produce more of its semiconductors in America. What do you think of this view? Can you just repeat the last question, please? I couldn't Sorry, hear it very um, well. So do you think this was perhaps a move by the Commerce Department in the US to get companies like Samsung or TSMC to invest more in America and move their production there? Um, if, if the Biden administration has been many has been global in many respects than Trump administration. Uh, let's take two concrete examples. It pushed for minimum tax rates for digital giants and created a global consensus on this issue. Uh, recall that Trump was against it. Uh, Biden made this move despite uh, the fact that it's going to hurt American companies. Second, he played a more proactive role in uh, Glasgow Summit, uh, promised to cut emissions and made uh, unprecedented investments in clean energy. Recall again that Trump pulled out of Paris Accord and blocked the measure that would have increased spending. So Biden has made a clean break from Trump's policies uh, in many respects but not when it comes to China. Uh, it has not only maintained Trump's tariff on, on Chinese goods, uh, they might even increase further. So in general, Biden has displayed a more global outlook, but a, but a more American-centric views on certain specific needs, such as for China and chips. Uh, and I think uh, the fact that US offers such a great market, as it has shown even during pandemic, it remains the world's biggest market. Any foreign company can, planning to uh, sell its products in US will have to take these facts into account. Well, it looks like it might be three more years of America first then. And well, in terms of the uh, energy crisis, uh, Dr. Hanfield, are there ways to overcome or mitigate shortages in countries that are greatly dependent on energy and commodity imports? I mean, what should they really do in the long run to secure these key materials? Well, you know, I think I think the most practical approach is to use, uh, you know, long term agreements. Um, we work with one company, Chenier Energy out of Houston, that uh, produces liquid natural gas, uh, puts it on ships and sends it across to Korea and, and China. And they have uh, 25 year contracts uh, of guaranteed supply with these two countries. Um, and it's good for the, the seller and it's good for the buyer. You have a guaranteed source. Um, I do also think that countries are starting to look around and are starting to look at uh, opportunities to do what I would call nearshoring. Uh, that is to start looking at uh, local countries that they are perhaps have neighborhood or relationships with and forming alliances with those. Uh, Africa clearly is a big provider of oil, Nigeria. Um, for things like DEF, Perhaps it's better to pay a little bit more and have it produced locally and uh, to not be reliant on China. And so I think, uh, you know, countries need to look at those strategic commodities that are really important to them and start developing strategies for either nearshoring, uh, reshoring, or forming long-term agreements with providers uh, and, and countries to uh, ensure the supply of these goods going forward. Uh, it's going to be a rocky road ahead. I don't, I don't think it, there's any easy solutions here, by the way. Oh, well, that leads to the $1 million question, Dr. Hanford. When do you see this crisis ending? Uh, and will it, is it going to affect the pace of global economic recovery from the pandemic? 
Uh, absolutely, and I've, I've been writing about this in, in my blogs and so forth. My prediction is that this is gonna last well into 2022 and possibly 2023. Um, I spoke with the White House Council of Economic Advisors last week, and uh, you know these are problems that are gonna require solutions and uh, engagement in, uh, in, and investments in infrastructure. We have an infrastructure bill here, um, but also looking at ports, looking at roads, looking at uh, critical industries, and uh, starting to invest. And these investments take years. They can take one or two or three years. In the short term, uh, we're gonna have to deal with these shortages. My prediction is we're gonna see a lot of inflation. Prices are going up. Transportation is going up. We're going to see continued uh, shortages of products, which will impact top line revenue. And we're gonna see costs go up. Uh, you put that all together and it's uh, look, looking oddly like inflation. And I think that's where we're headed. Well, it looks like we have very testy times ahead uh, in the next year or even beyond that. And well, that was uh, Dr. Robert Hanfield at North Carolina State University and Dr. Anup Srivastava at the University of Calgary. Thank you both so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you, Sian. Thanks. Bye. In 2020, the number of South Koreans and foreign nationals tying the knot was the lowest on record. Officials are attributing it to the pandemic. However, there was an increase in the percentage of babies born to multicultural families. In fact, they made up the highest ratio of all newborns in the country. Min Sukhyun reports. Marriages between South Koreans and foreign nationals fell to a record low last year amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Statistics Korea on Monday said that the number of international marriages stood at over 16,000 last year, down more than 8,500 from a year earlier. The figure is a decline of almost 35% on year. The latest data shows that the group accounted for less than 8% of all marriages in 2020. The sharp fall was attributed to the global surge in virus cases. Strict travel restrictions reduced cross border movements, leading to fewer international marriages. Meanwhile, the number of babies born to multicultural families in South Korea reached 16,400 last year, down 8.5 percent from the previous year. Despite the decrease, however, what appears to be interesting is that they made up 6 percent of all newborns in the country. In other words, 6 out of 100 newborns were in fact babies from multicultural families. It's by far the highest figure on record. Statistics Korea explained that this was largely due to the country's low birth rate. Last year, since the total number of births in South Korea dipped far more than the number of multicultural babies, the ratio jumped higher than expected. But the agency added that the number of multicultural children may not be as high in the following year since international marriages in 2020 saw a record low. Min Suk Kyun, Arirang News. K-pop sensations BTS will take the stage at the 2021 American Music Awards to perform their hit song Butter with Meg Megan the Stallion. The performance will mark the televised world premiere for a live performance of the song which topped the Billboard Hot 100 for 10 weeks earlier this year. BTS is a leading contender for the Top Artist of the Year award. Megan the Stallion, a rapper from the US, is nominated in three categories at the AMAs. The smash hit South Korean Netflix show Squid Game has led to a surge in popularity of the playground games featured in the series. An area in Korea's southeast is making the most of this trend by creating a place where families can get to together, enjoy the games and reminisce perhaps if they're a bit older about the 1960s and 70s. Ian Jin reports. What used to be an empty lot has been turned into the playground from Squid Game. People of all ages are gathering at the Whale Culture Village in Changsengpo, Ulsan to take part in games featured in the Netflix TV series. 
Children cannot watch Squid Game, but its popularity has spread around schools. It's been a lot of fun coming out here to play the different games from Squid Game with the children. From marbles to tracing shapes on Dalgona candy, as well as the Korean version of Red Light, Green Light, some participants also reenact scenes from the show. The Tangsengpo Whale Culture Village was created in 2015 to show what the village looked like in the 60s and 70s when whale hunting was prevalent. And now, thanks to the TV show, more than 10,000 people visit each weekend. Thank you for visiting this place to experience memories from the lifestyle of our past. We will do our best to take care of this neighborhood to preserve our memories. This whale culture village serves as a place for adults to reminisce about the past and as a family play playground for the younger generations. Yoon Jin, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. China's Communist Party is set to issue a resolution officially reassessing the party's 100-year history, which will also likely extend President Xi Jinping's rule. The move will also cement his status in China's history books alongside former leaders like Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping. And the Chinese government's newest official history shows the impact the Chinese leader had. According to the New York Times on Monday, the party's official history, which covers the 100 years of its Communist Party, is 531 pages long, of which over a quarter of it is dedicated to the nine years she has been in power. The 68-year-old is known as being the country's most powerful leader in decades, having also won widespread public support for attacking corruption, reducing poverty, while projecting China's strength to the rest of the world. However, Critics note his early mishandling of the COVID-19 pandemic and the rising tensions with the U.S. Despite this, the soon-to-be-passed resolution will certainly further raise Xi's status in the country moving forward. Pakistan and local Taliban militants on Monday agreed to a one-month ceasefire, which could potentially be extended if both sides agree. Under the agreement, the government of Pakistan and the banned TTP have agreed on a complete ceasefire. According to the agreement, the ceasefire will be extended as the talks continue. The minister added that the Taliban's interim government in Afghanistan have been involved in the talks, playing the role of facilitators. The agreement also comes as the TTP have fought for years to overthrow the government in Islamabad and rule the nation with their own brand of Islamic Sharia law. The militant group is also widely known for their attempt to kill Malala Yousafzai, the schoolgirl who went on to win the Nobel Prize for her work fighting for education for girls. The ceasefire will come into force starting Tuesday and will last until December 9th. With heavy rain pounding Sri Lanka, at least six people have lost their lives, with 4,300 others affected by massive flooding across the country. Reports say among those dead, two were killed by lightning. The country's meteorological department said a cyclone forming in the Bay of Bengal was moving closer to the island nation, and more rain is expected later this week. Landslide warnings have also been issued for six of the country's 25 districts, as the country fears the worst is yet to come. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. Good morning. A large area of cold air from the Arctic moved into the Korean Peninsula and morning temperatures in the capital are about 7 degrees lower than the same time yesterday. And the cold air makes it feel like just above freezing and it looks to be even colder tomorrow. Light rain continues across inland regions. More wet clouds will be ushering in, dropping rain in most areas today. So 5 to 20 millimeters of on and off rain is in the forecast. Meanwhile, mountainous regions in Gangwon-do province will see 10 centimeters of snow fall into tomorrow, with a chance the season's first snow advisory could be issued. 
Checking on our morning temperatures now, Chuncheon starting the day at just 1 degree Celsius, Seoraksan Mountain at minus 8.5 degrees Celsius, the coldest spot this morning. Then the highs will also be 4 to 5 degrees lower than season norms. Seoul and Chuncheon will be only at 9 degrees this afternoon, so please dress extra warmly today. With that, here's a look at the weather conditions around the world. And that's all we have for today. Thank you for watching and we'll be back at the same time on Wednesday, 8 a.m. Korea time with New Day at Arirang. I'm Kim mo -gyan. And I'm Mark Broom. I'll be back in just over an hour from now with our next newscast. But in the main, meantime, stay tuned to Arirang TV and we'll see you at the same time tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.